don't get up here very often, but when I do, I cry. <laughs> I, I just I love being in the presence of God with my fellow Christian friends, and I love CLC. Welcome here. My name is Pastor Andy Rogers, and I am the family pastor here, and I spend most of my time down in the basement, so it's nice. It, it smells fresher up here than it does down there for some reason, and, uh, but we're so glad to be here this morning. Welcome to our live stream crew that is here as well that we can't see, but we love you guys as well, and uh, so we're glad you're here. So we're so excited about today's message. Uh, we're going to unpack and actually talk about this again. I talked about this about 10 months ago, about this idea of getting personal, and uh, so we're going to talk about this. Well, I want to start off by saying that I'm very thankful for those who do serve in family ministry downstairs in the environments. And some people think, it's so funny, Bill took me aside just a few seconds ago and he's like, does everybody understand what happens when you do family ministry and everything? So I'm going to tell you that if you sign up to be in family ministry, it does not mean that you are like being sent to the dungeon. Okay, what it means is that we do get to sit and that means you get to come up here and hang out for an hour and 15 with the Lord, get filled, and then you get to go downstairs and hang out in the dungeon with us. It's awesome. And we, uh, we have so much fun and I love it. I see people in the audience right now that have served with us so faithfully and we are thankful. Can we just give everybody that works downstairs a huge hand? I'm assuming that just because I'm up here that everything is going okay downstairs with your kids. So I, we do have some trustworthy people that are taking care of business downstairs. So thank you volunteers though for all that you guys do. And uh, so speaking of being thankful uh, for, for this, uh, we have a special person. I don't know if she's here this morning or not, but, uh, but I just want to make mention of somebody who is actually, she's known as the chaplain of Above All Else. And, uh, and she's also a, a family ministry. She's a friend, a mentor, a mom to many more than her two adorable boys. And uh, so those of you guys know who Ryan Ballinger is. She's, I don't think she's here today, but, uh, but we just wanted to give her a special shout out because what you see downstairs right now is in a direct correlation of her being in those kids' lives. And every one of you guys have felt it. The time that we had during this pandemic where we were kind of just closed our doors down here and we were like, okay, now what? You know, and some of you guys are just like, yeah, what happened? And so we, we went on the road. We made all kind of little goodie bags up and we kind of hung out. We went to the cruises house and everything. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, you know, hunters like chasing us down the street, you know, as we're driving off and everything. It was so fun. But, uh, but we really, she helped us be able to create a connection to our families during a time when it was very difficult to do that. So if you see Ryan in the next few weeks, I want you to give her a big hug and just tell her how much that you care about her caring for your kids. So yeah, I know she's not here, but I tell you, hopefully she's listening online and we love you, Miss Ryan. All right. So in addition to being an amazing reader, Ryan was as a gifted teacher. So she's not just leaving us to leave us or anything like that. But Ryan has actually taken a position at Trinity Christian School, which is a very amazing, awesome, rigorous school uh, that, uh, that requires a lot. And so she's kind of getting back into the workforce as a teacher again. So if you think about it, be praying for her. And, uh, and she, her kids are going to be going to Trinity as well. It's going to be a great opportunity for her to to even have more of an impact in the Christian community here in Northern Virginia. So super excited about that. Well, listen, how many of you guys were here last week? Raise your hand if you were here. Some of you guys did. What did we talk about? What did Pastor Bill talk about? Anybody know? Angels, that's right. And, uh, and how many people thought, you know, and he was, he, he, we, zillions of stories about how God uses angels today in this very present world that we live in, right? And you're, and, but how many of you are kind of like, yeah, seriously, Bill, really? You know, is that really happening? No, it, it couldn't really happen. But I am here to tell you that Bill's angel stories are true. And I actually have an angel story for you right now. Are you guys ready for this? 
I had one, a phone call on my phone Thursday morning. I was thinking of my mom. You know, some of you guys know that my mom passed away uh, last month. And, uh, and my dad had to go into a home. He's got Alzheimer's disease and stuff. And so just, a, uh, you know, kind of a trying time for the Rogers family, right? And uh, so I was thinking about something. I watched this movie. I don't know if you guys have seen um, We Bought a Zoo. Okay, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's awesome. Make sure you carry some tissues with you if you do. But, it, but there was a scene in there that was at the very end of the movie with some kites. And if you know anything about grieving, the weirdest things can cause you to start grieving about something. And so I just thought about my dad who helped me build kites and stuff when I was a kid. And I'm watching this. I'm going, uh, uh, and I'm thinking about it the next day. And I'm still going, uh, uh, you know, and everything. And, I, and all of a sudden, I get a phone call in the middle of this. Well, normally, if I'm having one of these, what am I going to say, uh, uh, moments, I'm not going to answer the phone. But this time, I felt like I really should answer the phone. And so I did, and I said, hey, this is Andy Rogers. How can I help you? And they said, well, is Philip Rogers there? And I said, yes, this is Philip Andrew Rogers. And the person on the other line said, I understand, and it's okay. Click. Yeah, I <laughs> know, pins and needles. I, I kid you not. So you can say, well, it was a wrong number, it was whatever. But I really believe that God spoke to me to that person that was on the other line. Whether it was an angel or somebody used by God, I just know that it's true that there are angels here in this world that what do they do? They come to what? Comfort us, right? In our moments that we have. The, okay, I'm not gonna do it again, okay? All right, so here's the thing. I love personal stories. Do you guys love personal stories? I love personal stories. So we know that in, every one of us in this room, if you're an adult that's probably over the age of 20 or so, that you have some life-changing decisions that change the rest of your life. It, the trajectory of your life went a different path because of that decision that you made, right? So I had a few of those uh, growing up, a decision to get personal, right, uh, with someone. And so we all decided to get personal with our maker first. I think that's one thing that we have to do in order to know where the rest of our life is going to go. So fortunately, I started early. I came to Christ at age seven. You're like, right, sure you did. But no, I really did. I remember with my Hot Wheels car, I was in my rec room. We had just been to a meeting Sunday night at our church and this guy talked about Christ and everything and had the crosses behind. And, I, and he said, and he did this for you. And I could have sworn he, he was pointing right at me, you know. And so I went home that night. I didn't go up front that evening at the service, but I came home and I just had another one of those, oh no, I'm not going to do it again. But I started crying and I was playing with my Hot Wheels car. My mom came up to me and said, what's wrong? I said, I just can't believe Jesus loves me this much and everything. It was just, and it was like this thing. And I tell you, this seven-year-old decision that I made changed the rest of my life. It was a trajectory change. You know, I went from being selfish to being unselfish in a lot of different ways. Now, my brother probably would tell you otherwise, but, but I really did. There was a change that happened, and for the next 50 years, I've been serving God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength because of that decision that I made to follow Jesus that morning. So, another moment. I had two moments here, all right? The other moment is this one when I asked Missy, to date me. And if you see my, my beautiful wife that has red hair up there, she's awesome. Looks lovely in a peach uh, sweater there. Uh, but uh, so my 20 seconds of insane courage was grabbing a piece of like legal paper and started writing on this piece of paper. And I, you know, I had it at my desk. And I let her know how I felt about her and how she fit into God's story that we had for both of us, you know, in our lives. And it was the 20 year old version of like, check yes if you like me. Heck no, if you don't, you know, and then we're just going to move on, uh, you know, but it ended up being a narrative of what could be. You ever thought about that before? Do you see these things, you watch movies that have those little blips of like, this is what your life could be if you make this choice or whatever. And I think of it as a Venn diagram, like there's this big circle that's Jesus, right? That's God. And then there's these two little circles, Missy over here, me over here. And it all intersects right in between, right? You know, and these three circles intersected for such a time. I mean, I got really amazing in this, this I don't know, I, 
where this all came from. I had this, you know, kind of thing that happened. And there was like, I remember it's like one o'clock in the morning when I'm writing this thing. And, uh, but it was a leap of faith. It was a leap of faith. I didn't know if she was going to accept or reject or anything like that, right? And uh, I decided to get personal. And to get personal is a little, it puts you out of your comfort zone, doesn't it? Right? And I'm so glad I did. And 30 years later, we're still together, hanging out, making decisions together, listening to one another, using active listening. I know if you want to talk about this, you can set up an appointment with me. I can tell you how to do it. And I'm still learning today, 30 years later, you know, and I love, I love doing life with Missy, just as I love doing life with all of you guys, because we really are doing life together here at CLC. So, and I now believe that it's time for us to talk about getting personal. So, there's a shallow way that we have, right? That, you know, we talk about, you know, we kind of smile a little bit and say hi. High five maybe as you walk by and that kind of thing. But see, there was a situation and a time for me when God and Missy stepped into my life at a pivotal moment in my life, right? And offered me the opportunity to see a better future, And because they did this for me, it's my turn to do that for somebody else this morning. And that's you. But this can be a challenge, right? At some point, it becomes very, very difficult for us to engage with someone at that level. It's very difficult. Somewhere around middle school, we all develop this coping mechanism, right? What's it called? It's called life is hard. Everybody say it with me. Life is hard, right? And then we all kind of like take that and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's this crazy thing. The older we get, the harder life gets, right? And uh, the more we exercise this skill set. And it's a kind of an unspoken philosophy of living. You know, there's not really an author of this that I know of. You know, it's not devoutly studied. We don't do our PhDs and life is hard, uh, you know. But it, it might be a good book though, Bill. What do you think? I don't know. Uh, you know, so, you know, but for now, let's just call this the shallow way. This life is hard thing. So now hear me out. Shallow has some incredible benefits, all right? A little bit of shallow allows you to smile politely, make small talk, carry on with your day. It's the only way I know to spill coffee in your lap as you're driving, almost wrecking your car, shouting at your kids in the back, and finally getting to church going, praise God, I'm so glad I'm here. This is such a great day. Hi, brother, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. It's good, good. Yeah, you know? And, uh, and then walk into work and make a presentation or you've, that you've rehearsed. Sometimes shallow is necessary, right? Shallow might mean that we, it's, uh, you might want to throw a little filter on your Instagram, right? A little sparklies in your hair or something like that. I don't know. That's not what I do, but, but uh, you know, so whatever, turn, you know, it, it makes you happy. And, uh, you know, but it really makes for a good looking photo and maybe we move the laundry out of the way. So, uh, you know, or even put a different background so it looks like you're in Paris. I don't know what you do, but, uh, but I think it's great, you know, and it's okay to enjoy a shallow version of people. And it's okay to even be shallow sometimes ourselves, right? But over time, you can become a little too good at living shallow. You begin to act as if your very little is worth your time. You have a hard time caring about things that you know that you should be caring about. And you choose comfort over risk, right? And a certainty over curiosity, And I don't know about you, but I never want to lose my curiosity. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be that one that that was sitting in the background just on the sideline, you know, and and I don't know if you've ever watched like somebody that's not the starting five on a basketball team. Where are they? Where you guys are right now. You're on the bench, right? You know, but you know, you could tell who's the one that's ready to go, right? Right. Are they just sitting there kind of like hands back like this and just kind of like has a drink in their hand? What are they doing? No, it's the ones that are like, they're on the balls of their feet. They're just moving. You can't even stop moving their legs because they're so wanting to get out there and relieve somebody that's on the starting five to get in there to make a difference to help win the game. So shallow in some relationships, guess what this? It makes us polite, right? You know, it's good to be shallow in some situations, but shallow in every relationship can actually make us lonely. We need to get in the game. 
It's okay to be shallow, but it's not okay to always be shallow. Most of us know that if we live too shallow for too long, we will eventually fall apart. And if kids and teenagers grow up in a shallow approach to life, they're going to likely self-destruct as they enter adulthood. And nobody wants that for their kids. You wake up one morning and say, yeah, you know, let's just let's take the easy route. Let's just go that way and and you'll be fine. You'll have a great life. Uh, You know, no, you want God's best for your kids, right? And we want God's best for you as the pastors of this church. We want to see you guys grow in your knowledge of who God is, but that's not grow in the knowledge, but actually use it and serve, right? So isn't it interesting that the very construct of this shallowness to protect ourselves And to hold ourselves together is ultimately the thing that can undo us, you know? It's the shallow approach of life that can rob us of our potential to give a kid or a teenager hope. But before we talk about that, it might be best to unpack what we mean by shallow. And since we often define things by their opposite, uh, what's the opposite of shallow? Let me hear you. Okay, good. (laughs) You guys got the right answer, but not completely right. We're going to find out. And thank you for playing. All right. The fair, it's a fair question. If you want something to tip the scales in your life, uh, you want to see something that offsets. You don't want it to go all the way over to the other side, right? You want it to go nice and be balanced, right? How many people want to have balance in your lives? How many people have strived for balance in your lives? And it's just not quite happening sometimes. We always tend to go all the way over on the other side, don't we, sometimes? But guess what? That offsets a chance to give it balance. So the literal literal answer, of course, is deeper, as you said. So you're semi-right. But what is deeper? Let's look at this. Sometimes we mask ourselves with deepness. Mask becomes in all shapes and sizes. And we're often tempted, right, to the right shallowness we observe in someone we simply, by applying a different mask uh, to ourselves, so religion is, is a friend of this, unfortunately. A friend of the shallow for centuries. In Christian circles, we like to the right of shallowness of a thing we call culture. You've always said, you know, you hear Bill talks about church culture all the time. We talk about building a culture for the kids downstairs. You know, culture is shallow though. And so here is the sacred place where you're deeper. But deeper, how are we deep in, in church? Deeper in our understanding of theology? Deeper in our spiritual practice or deeper in our knowledge of Palestinian architecture, which is kind of cool, you know, but, uh, but all these things are just masks, I think, that we put on, uh, you know, of making a deeper, just another version of shallow in disguise. So if we, what if the opposite of shallow living isn't so much deeper, but it's maybe the opposite of shallow living is learning to be personal, Think about it. Shallow is fast. Personal takes time. Shallow is easy. Personal is complicated. Shallow is safe. Personal is risky. Shallow is certain. Personal is unresolved. Shallow is dismissive. Personal is honest. Shallow is familiar. Personal is unpredictable. And shallow costs money. And personal costs me. Think about it. How did the shot, good job slide people. That was pretty good. Oh my gosh, amazing. So you don't typically have to work at being shallow, but you have to work at getting personal. Just like I got out of my comfort zone to ask Jesus into my heart. Just as I got out of my comfort zone to go deeper with a relationship with Missy. Those things took guts to do. And, but it changed the trajectory of my life. And I would not be here today if it wasn't for Missy. I would not be here today if it wasn't for Jesus. And uh, so the result of shallow ministry, guess what? Is disillusionment. But the result of personal ministry, man, let me tell you. It's the hope for us that serve. Right? So the hope for those we serve. Okay? So each one of us has a sphere of influence. We found this out way back in the day. I'm looking at Julie right now. She and I actually went to seminary together back in Virginia Beach. And uh, and we talked about these spheres of influence that we all possess. And some of us don't even realize it. It's like this person that you uh, meet at the grocery store. It's the person that you uh, connect with sitting here at CLC. You know, 
so here's the thing. Well, Jesus made it personal, didn't he? Right? Just as he's desiring us to do this, to do the same. That's why Jesus showed up in a religiously impersonal culture that he did. And I know that it was such a time of this moment. There's a reason why. And this is one of those reasons. Because it was a very impersonal religious culture that they lived in at the time. And he wanted to establish a stark contrast between a personal God and any version of God that portrayed him as indifferent or disinterested. He wanted to change what was going on of how the thinking was happening at that time. So Jesus became human to prove that God loves humans, right? Jesus became human so to show humans how to love God. And Jesus became human to show humans how to love other humans. The point is, is that Jesus made it personal. He touched people who had diseases, right? What else did he do? He spoke respectfully of a scandalous woman. Ooh, you know, he wept at the tomb of a friend. He was real. He wept real tears for people. He broke a rule to get somebody out of trouble. He met leaders privately in the middle of the night. Scandalous, right? He washed the feet of the disciples. Mm, smelly. He invited himself to wild parties even. And the, my favorite part of this whole narrative of what we find out about Jesus in the New Testament is this, he played with toddlers. He loved kids. He saw the value in kids. He saw how moldable and shapeable they are at this age and he could tell them truth and they were just like, okay, I believe it because it's truth. And they didn't have all these filters to go through before they heard the truth. And they knew who, he, who Jesus was. So Jesus honored those who were disgraced. He befriended those who were marginalized. He embraced those who were rejected. He forgave those who were shunned. And he believed in those who were broken. Wow, kind of sounds like our church. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there's some days that I feel broken. There's some days when I feel shunned. Some days when I feel rejected. But you know what? God says something otherwise about you. That kind of sounds like the opposite of shallow living, doesn't it? Right? It's interesting that Jesus never got so busy trying to save everyone that he didn't stop to help someone. Okay, I love Zacchaeus. Maybe because I am only 5'8 and something and change and everything. But I understand who Zacchaeus was. And I believe that Jesus used Zacchaeus to tell a town that there was something special about who this guy was. Gospel according to Luke records a well-known story of a wealthy tax collector who had a reputation for cheating people out of their money. One day, the notorious businessman heard that Jesus was passing through his town. In an attempt to get a glimpse of this famous rabbi, he ran and sprinted ahead of the crowd and scrambled up a tree, right? We all know the story. And it just so happened, though, that Jesus spotted the man as he's going up the tree, right? He stopped him and he called him by name in front of everyone. What Jesus did next would shock an entire community, he actually invited himself to the tax collector's home to stay the night. Wow, the criticism, the rumors began to circulate through this little town. And why would Jesus so favor to someone like Zacchaeus? How could Jesus not know that this man has done to so many different families in this town? What good would come from spending time with the most dishonest guy in the community? It was clear when Zacchaeus climbed down the, from the sycamore tree that no one in the crowd saw him the way Jesus saw him. Think about that for a minute. That's how Jesus sees you. He sees you as nobody else does. The crowd saw a man who was driven by personal greed, right? The crowd saw an individual who would use anybody, anybody to get ahead. And the crowd saw someone who had hurt their community, right? But not Jesus. He saw a man with intrinsic worth. He saw an individual who reflected God's image. And he saw someone with fascinating abilities and potential. Jesus never let public opinion change how he saw him, how it saw anyone, not just Zacchaeus. 
He doesn't let public opinions see how he sees you. So Jesus never saw that. Now think about this. The way Jesus saw Zacchaeus ultimately changed the way everybody else saw Zacchaeus. Better yet, the way Jesus saw Zacchaeus personally changed the way that Zacchaeus saw himself. And Zacchaeus' personal character with Jesus was transformational. That's because something remarkable happened when you start seeing people the way Jesus sees people. No one imagined that Jesus' personal interaction with one man would change an entire town, but guess what? It did. Zacchaeus' perspective and character changed so much that Jesus said, and I love these words, this should be a movie, I don't know what, uh, the, the line at the end, right? Today, salvation has come to your house. And you know what? It wasn't just Zacchaeus that heard the truth. It was his wife. It was his kids. Everybody in that household knew Jesus, encountered Jesus, and they were not the same. You and I cannot experience the, the, God, the goodness of God here at CLC without being changed. Jesus implied that something had happened immediately in Zacchaeus' life that would transform the rest of his life. It was a decision that was made that changed the trajectory of this man. That's the effect an encounter with Jesus has on someone's life. It's as if you were saying, you were living an empty, lonely, shallow existence. And now that I'm here, you can start living life with a different kind of hope. We need to remember that the gospel is meant to be personal. Maybe we should take a cue from Jesus and stop limiting the gospel to only what happens when somebody dies. Maybe it's helpful to remember how a personal encounter with Jesus can actually impact someone's personal life while they are living. A great example of this is my mother. I know Bill likes to talk about his mom all the time, you know, good old Pastor Bill's mom. I love her. I love hearing stories about people's heritage. It's beautiful. And my mom, as I told you earlier today, that she passed this past, uh, last month. And she was an amazing woman. She accepted Jesus when she was seven. She started teaching Sunday school when she was in high school. She led women's Bible studies. She actually helped lead a homeless church right here in Fairfax, Virginia at 70 some years old. And there were just the list goes on and on and on. How do I know this? Not just because I know all the stories, but because I went to their, her funeral. And at her funeral on a Friday morning at 10 a.m., there were 400 people that came to honor my mom. Yeah, it's pretty special. Because my mom was very special. And just like Zacchaeus, my, 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 uh, Jesus saw something special about my mom and knew that there was all these things that she was going to do. He saw all those things that she did throughout her life that impacted individuals. And you and I are no different we have the same ability. Everybody goes, well, that was Pat Rogers, you know. She was an angel, and she was. But I tell you what, I had a 70-year-old lady come up to me after the funeral and said, wow, your mom has inspired me. I am going to go lead a Bible study. I am going to go, lead, uh, go out and help my homeless in my hometown where I came from in Pennsylvania. She, she was still, the legacy still lives on. Do you see that? And the legacy lives on with us as we pass this stuff on to this next generation that we're talking about that are right downstairs below us right now. At the end of Zacchaeus' story, Jesus clarified the idea even further when he reminds everyone of his mission. What was Jesus' mission? The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Some scholars even speculate that this was the summative statement in the book of Luke. Zacchaeus had lost his sense of identity until Jesus called him by name. He said, calm down out of that tree. Zacchaeus had lost his sense of belonging until Jesus said, I am coming to your house. 
Let's spend some time together. Let's put another shrimp on the Barbie, right? You know, and then Jesus had lo- or Zacchaeus had lost his sense of purpose until Jesus saw him in a different way than the crowd had seen him. Then Zacchaeus had hope. He had hope. And he began to realize his potential to be a part of a remarkable story that Jesus had started writing at the beginning of time for him. A story about how a greedy tax collector could transform into a generous friend. Don't miss this. What Jesus did for Zacchaeus was personal. The story uh, uh, was a remarkable story, wasn't it? He pulled Zacchaeus out of the crowd so that he could spend time with him. His mission was personal. Jesus called him out. Jesus, as he calls me out on an iPhone on Thursday and said, it's okay. The church needs more leaders to learn how to become personal because too many kids feel invisible or ignored. There is an epidemic. I know everybody's thinking of COVID, you know, a variant, but I'm not talking about that kind of of a disease. We're talking about an epidemic of bullying, that happens in our schools today. An an epidemic of emotional abuse, depression, self-harm, suicide among teenagers and kids. These statistics are staggering when you look at them. And I don't like to even think about it, but I know that's why we're doing what we're doing here at CLC with these kids every week, to give them a hope and a reason to live. If we think these issues are going to go away by deeper worship songs, deeper Bible studies, and deeper theological debates than we are actually shallow in our thinking. And all those things are good, right? Because I don't know about you, but worship today changed me. I love being in the presence of the Lord. I love studying the Bible. And I love theological debates. It's so much fun. But I tell you what, we need to get personal. The legacy of any great church is not how many people show up on a Sunday morning but rather by how many of those who come on Sunday actually decide to show up in someone's life. Remember, for all of us, this gravitational pull always will be towards shallow. So we, and we can easily convince ourselves that we need to add followers. I got 1,800, man. I'm, I'm, I'm set, you know? It's pretty cool. I build a platform, right? Okay? Or teach a lesson. You know, I talked about uh, a wonderful... Schuler that is actually, her name's Taylor. You guys know her on Instagram and she's awesome. And, uh, you know, she, she kind of just is a narrative of her life. But it's not just a narrative of her life. It's a narrative of her life when she encounters God, which makes all the difference. You can be an influencer and check, yes, I see you and you can see me and all that. But she takes it a step further. It's not just about her clothes shopping, which are awesome, by the way, and the fun skits that she does on Instagram as well. But what's so cool about it is that she uses this platform to get personal. And you're like, how can you get personal with Instagram? Start looking at the replies on her account. It's amazing to me. I, I wanna be more like Taylor, I'm just saying. So we desperately need to redefine what we mean by deeper to invite a generation of people to become more personal. The legacy, again, of any church is not how many people we have, but it's by how many people decide to show up in somebody else's life. So stop and look around, guys. There's someone who needs you to see them. If you look closely, there's a kid who has pushed his way past the crowd into a space where they hope that you'll notice them. They are hungry for anyone to invite them to experience a life-giving relationship. They need you to see the everyday world that is defining them today. They need you to see the private doubts that are paralyzing them. This happens in small groups downstairs. They need you to see the potential future that is waiting for them. They have a hope and a future, but somebody needs to tell them that. They need you to do what Jesus did for Zacchaeus. Invite them out of the crowd and make it personal. You may be their best chance of finding hope and believing. There's a a profound thought. You can't really be personal with a crowd, can you? 
I can try my best to do that from up here, but I really can't do it unless I get down off of this stage and I shake your hand and say, hi, my name's Andy, what's yours? Right? Stated another way, you can't be personal with everyone, but you can, you can with someone. The crowd tempts you to stay shallow, but showing up for someone will urge you to become more personal. It's contagious. It really is. So Jesus identified Zacchaeus in a way that communicated value. Jesus instinctively addressed what mattered to Zacchaeus. He, Jesus took the time to enter into Zacchaeus' everyday context. Jesus responded to Zacchaeus in a way that removed shame. And Jesus believed in Zacchaeus' potential to do good. So what if you could do the same? What's this, what if this idea, it's personal, is for real? Identify someone in a way that communicates value Discover what matters to someone and prove they really matter. Take the time to understand someone's everyday context. Remind someone in a way that replaces shame with hope. Believe in someone's potential to live a remarkable story. Jesus is at the beginning of my story. Messi came in and exponentially changed my story forever. And he can do the same for you to give you a hope and a future. The point is, if you want to make a difference, then it has to be personal. So I want my wife to come up here for a minute, and I want her to share something with you guys, and then we're going to pray. So I asked Missy to come. Everybody say hi, Missy. Hi. We love you. Okay, just uh, nobody take it. You know I love you because this is not my favorite thing. It's true. She's the most introverted person I know. And, uh, but she's doing a great job. Everybody give her another big hand. Come on. All right. All right. I don't like these things either. I usually use my mom or my teacher voice. Um, so I'm Missy Rogers. I am Andy's wife. Monday through Friday, I am a preschool teacher. Um, so we came up with an agreement um, early on in our ministry together once I started teaching that on Sundays, I don't do kids. I believe in serving. This was a great sermon. You know, I totally am there, um, but just not with the kids, you know, to save our marriage, to save my sanity. Um, You know, I'll find somewhere else to serve. So I've been doing that, and it's been great um, until this year. So um, a big shortage of volunteers in a lot of ministries, but especially in family ministry. So I heard the little small voice and the heavenly tap on my shoulder that since it's summer, um, you know, I don't really have the excuse it's summer, um, only for another week I start next week. Um, (laughs) But just, you know, since it's summer, I can do this. Like, okay, so before I thought too hard about it, I jumped in and I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, The issue was it was with the two and three-year-olds. Now, I have taught kindergarten forever. Um, Right now, I teach preschool, and a lot of people, it's funny when I tell them what I do, they either go, oh, or oh. Um, But that's how I feel about two-year-olds. I'm, I'm, you know, I have a teaching degree. I'm a mom. I have my own kids that are grown now. Um, You know, I've taught for over 20 years, but guys, two-year-olds are scary. Um, so I was a little terrified and ner- a little nervous. So I decided, you know what? I'm, I'm, God is telling me to do this, so I'm going to jump in. And I don't know. Andy didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect. So I tell you what, it's been so fun. They are the cutest little guys. And they, you know, listen to the story. And we're singing and we're dancing. And that's all of my favorite things. And they're just, like he said, they're so pliable. And so, you know, and what this is all about is to... You want them here at Jesus, you know, in early age, and that's what this is. So let me tell you, if, if you're hearing that still small voice and that heavenly tap on your shoulder, before you think about it too hard, <laughs> sign the card, do what you got to do, um, and just, you know, can you tell the story? This job's for you. Can you play with toys? This job's for you. Do you like to dance? This job's for you. So even with my training and, you know, you would look at my resume and think, oh, yeah, I was terrified too. So let me just say, if you're hearing that still small voice and you're feeling like God is saying, okay, you know, do this. Don't think too hard. Take that step of faith. And it's so worth it. And really, that's what it's all about. It's not about me, and it's not about my fears. It's about these little guys, and they need to hear about Jesus. So if you can, like I said, if you can play with toys, if you can tell a story, you can do this. Awesome. Just take a moment.
Isn't she great? <laughs> I love her. Um, so I just, I want to thank you guys for joining us today. And I want you to think about this idea uh, of personal with somebody else. And, and I, you know, like I said, Bill earlier kind of pulled me aside. He goes, maybe think people think that if you sign up down there, then you're just down there for the rest of your life or anything like that. So it is a certain amount of time, basically from uh, September to June is our kind of our, our school year that we have. And you sign on for those things. You can sign up for twice a month. If you want to be down there every week, we'd love for you to be down there every week um, and everything. But even if you sign up for down there, you can still sit up here for one service and go down there and hang out and everything. So we, it's, we make this as easy as possible. We don't ask you to, uh, to kind of come up with all of the activities and things like that on your own. Uh, we actually do all that for you. So it's really pretty easy. You can actually just walk in and do it. You plus play on a video uh, you know, thing on the TV. It's so easy. And, uh, and these kids are, are just r- miraculous and amazing. And you just the, each week that you're with them, you find out something new and incre- incredible about them. So if you'd like to get in- involved with the kids and teenagers that enter into these doors every week, we'd love to talk to you about that. Some of you guys may have seen there's like cards. If you do not have a card, there's Mr. Ben in the back. Raise your hand, Mr. Ben. Thank you, sir. Uh, There are some cards in the back there that he can hand you. You guys fill out those cards, put it in there. If you're like, well, I'm not a a small group guy. I'm not a, a, you know, I don't play guitar or anything like that. Well, you could be a part of our check-in team who is actually needing some extra help as well. And all that is, is just welcoming people as they come in, wave, put a smile. It kind of reminds me of the smiley guy with the sticker at Walmart, right? The same, same same thing, but you guys can speak life to the parents as they walk in as well. There's a place for everyone in this ministry. So thank you so much. Let's do, uh, do me a favor. Let's all bow our heads and pray and ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, we just thank you for giving us the gift of hope. Thank you for giving us a better future, Lord God, than what we originally thought for ourselves when we said yes to you. Lord, help us to look around and see the opportunities that you've given us to make a difference for this next generation. God, I believe that this, uh, there's a generation that is rising up if a father would rise up, if a mother would rise up and invest in them and love them like Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You guys have a great week. If God spoke to you this morning, I want you to fill out that card and give it to, uh, to Ben in the back and everything. We'd love to talk to you more about this in the future.